tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about gruesome greed and elderly evils. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of John Allen and Samuel J. Allen are voice talents Melissa Medina and Nick Goroff. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our Theater of the Minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Segment Story 1 Introduction Our first tale this evening is written by John Allen and is performed by Melissa Medina. In it, we'll meet Narnia Kazarian, a young influencer with millions of adoring fans due to the success of her beauty tutorial channel. In this Twilight Zone-influenced psychological paranormal expose of the tunnel vision the quest for fame and likes creates, we experience Narnia's final days as she fails to witness the many warning signs that have been blinded by her own vanity and greed. Without further ado, I present to you, Oblivious. I have never been a reader, so I don't know how it's possible, but there's a proverb I know. The dead cannot reveal any secrets. Given my current state, I choose to disagree. My name is Narnia Kazarian, but I was the chronic cool of Narnia entity. It's cute, right? Yes, an obvious play on words, homage to the C.S. Lewis novels that were my namesake. Maybe it was a tad narcissistic, but the pun worked within the confines of my popular online beauty channel. Glamily members, it's your girl Narnia K dropping in one last time before Friday night's Trendies, streaming live from the Dolby Theater in downtown LA at 8. As I plug the fledgling influencer award show, Around 700,000 viewers would hear those words, the last spoken in life. That multitude of people does not log off in perfect harmony. My assumption was a glitch when the digits on the view tracker dropped into nothingness almost as quickly as they disappeared. It made little sense at the time. Now it all makes sense. So many things make sense now. My current reality is that I've been reliving my final days and now see the missed details that should have smacked me in the face then. It began when I closed the laptop on that last broadcast and Miss Daddy's evident note next to the PC, the Escalade has half a tank. You must fill it up before leaving. Ugh, the replay is starting again. After finishing that last live stream, my iPhone quakes, but I hit silent without looking at the screen. I assume it's the usual influx of after-show fan comments, and I can't be bothered. It's always an admirer praising me or a troll seeking attention. It's time to leave Calabasas anyway, as I have planned to spend the next two days prepping for the awards ceremony an hour away in the solitude of the family cabin hidden deep in the woods away from LA traffic or trick-or-treaters. As camping trips go, it wouldn't exactly be that. 
Looking back, it was hardly a rough outing for me. The 22-year-old, privileged, entitled daughter of real estate magnate Ephraim Kazarian and famed 70s model Janet Price. Rich people are bizarre. We exist in one world, ours, while everyone else does their own thing. A mere cabin to daddy is another $3 million chunk of dreams. Yes, I now realize the life of Narnia Kazarian was quite charmed. Realizing it now is too late and pointless. I think wealth and fame led to my demise. Actually, I'm sure of it. Vanity and excess bread tunnel vision. Have I mentioned that you hear a ghost? My channel's success surprised no one. Ariel was my best friend and the starlet of the Hulu horror series 13 Terrors, and she tweeted about my channel early on. Lennon was a friend whose mom was reality TV famous, and also tweeted photos of a makeover I gave her, double dipping into our shared quest for attention. That was huge. Then, God herself smiled upon me, because when a Kardashian follows you, you become insta-famous. My beauty game was decent, maybe above average, but I'm honest since I'm dead now. It was nothing compared to rival streamers. However, they had no names to drop or celebs to tag. Pretty and rich consistently exceeds skill. That's the reality in that space. At the time, though, I assumed the success was my birthright. I'm not sure how long since time is not real anymore, but I've been watching the final days of my life like a documentary. I'm... Embarrassed. I'm watching now. I watched the Escalade amble through my gated neighborhood on that gorgeous October day with half a tank of gas as my selfie fingers clutch the phone and my perched lips curve into action. I swerve and almost sideswipe a car, only to laugh about it. Once I post whatever was so urgent, the likes and upvotes, things the material girl I was always craved, merely trickle in with a whimper unlike the typical barrage of heart emoticons. I'm curious, for sure, but I have no time to wonder, as suddenly the app freezes and the phone rattles with violence. Another amber alert, I figure, and toss the tech addiction aside. Missed calls from mom and unread texts from daddy are also tossed aside, but I don't realize it. The living me wouldn't have. The dead me notices everything, and I wonder if this is hell. Merging onto the PCH, I peruse my speech while soaking in the coastline. Breaking news interrupts the radio, an annoyance quickly discarded in favor of Lana Del Rey on Spotify. I think the ocean view must be spectacular since cars are stopping and people exit their vehicles to stare. <laughs> Tourists. I laugh aloud at the out-of-state plates. Go away, you can't afford to live here. Why torture yourselves? Ugh, that privileged voice. At the cabin, our caretaker is missing. A mental note to have been fired is filed. How will the massage therapist get in tomorrow? Or the driver on Friday? I open the gate and leave it that way, seeing my inconvenience, but somehow not seeing the note been affixed to the wrought iron bars. Then I carry my bags like a savage. What a fool I was looking back, lugging that oversized junk in my red soled Louboutin heels. Night one. It's immediately exhausting. The Wi-Fi won't work, so my toys are useless. Logic says to read the text from my parents, but I opt to play Candy Crush as the battery drains. I plan to stream my prep work. People love the behind-the-scenes voyeur shot. My primary dress is a vintage, original 1978 Versace that mom wore in a Vanity Fair spread with Cher and Farrah Fawcett. In case of disaster, I have my backup gown and my backup's backup, both Tom Ford creations. I have three grand in cosmetics, Chanel, Dior, and MAC for one use. My hair is pre-coiffed, and only a few minor adjustments will be required, which my chronic cool can easily handle. I have everything, but the most important thing, I have no audience to watch the process thanks to the Wi-Fi horrifying me. I know this dead version of me will be 22 for the rest of eternity, but I feel like a wise old sage when absorbing the pretentiousness of the living me. I decided to be gross and watch cable since that's the disaster I'm left with, but all channels are blank, except one. A local station struggles through, and some anchor with helmet hair is being dramatic. Probably another wildfire, I guess. Click. I'm bored already. Minutes later, gently placed cucumber slices blanket my eyes, and I slide my sensory deprivation pods into my ears and fall into a slumber to fight the frustration. Or at least I think I did. 
Somewhere in the middle of the night, I stir. Initially, I knew I must have dreamt it because the cracking, thundering explosion couldn't have penetrated my noise-canceling pods. Regardless, I'm now awake. Gone is the electricity, the lifeblood for everything I am. My weary eyes peer outside through a now fractured window, cucumber juice hitting my pupils, and I see nothing. Had I looked closer, I might have noticed the dearth of stars in an area famous for sky watching. In the stead, I dance to the tune of self-pity. There is no way to Skype with Dr. Paulson, so I give up on the evening again. Oh, an emergency generator sits alone in the basement, but I'm not about to touch that greasy thing. I could scoot into town had my gas tank not been stuck on E. I nestle sleepy and annoyed under my Burberry covers and weighted blanket. Thursday is even worse. No power, only one day until the awards. All ways to tell time are drained. Flashing a cursory glance toward the window, I notice a faded yellow haze is outside, which is not normal. Eerie lighting does not pique my interest. Most people would have been ravaged with curiosity, but not the fabulous Narnia Kazarian. Why? Breakfast is paramount on my mind. After all, it is my final meal until after the awards tomorrow. Salivating at the thought of avocado toast, I realize there's no way to actually toast it. I take malicious glee now in watching the living me falter because it's so ridiculous and unfathomable how dense I was. Seeing my face morph into a pathetic pout is strangely satisfying in this dead place I live now. This dastardly abode called hindsight. Breakfast becomes sips of grapefruit juice as I attempt to get anything from my gadgets. The devices remain silent, but not everything is muted. Sirens blare in the hills, and with clarity. What do I do? I soak. I soak in more Lana with the remaining life on my MP3, and I soak in the basement jacuzzi, enjoying the still warm water while it lasts. The living me didn't see the battery-powered radio displayed atop the generator. The dead me can only see it, and nothing else. Oh, this part makes me sick. After enjoying the cabin's amenities, I gaze into my vanity mirror with great affection for myself for several hours. An antique porcelain brush weaves through strawberry blonde strands as I practice emoting from my good side. The question of when the girl from the spa will arrive for my foot massage pokes me. My pampering is scheduled for six, so I'll use the girl's phone to call daddy and fix everything wrong with a stupid cabin like the inept caretaker and shoddy wiring and the rest of the unacceptable misfortunes that don't belong in a civilized world. The spa girl is late. Waiting is not something I do. I wait and I wait some more. A solar tiki torch allows me to inspect the Versace with a feverish vigor for flaws. I investigate the cabin and saunter into Daddy's media room, which is covered with walls of DVDs. His antique viewing platform makes me laugh. His collection of movies is not my vibe. Independence Day, Idiocracy, Clueless, uh, no Channing Tatum anywhere. Darkness envelops the cabin and Spa Girl is AWOL, so muscle memory causes me to reach for my phone to drag the spa over social. There's still no electricity and I've watched this part often since I've been dead and this stupidity always makes me label the living me as such a pretentious, affected twit. All hope in the reflexology session dies, and so does the tiki torch. The cabin has become the darkest variant of Onyx possible. Through my periscope into the final hours of my life, I watch myself stumble through the shadows, reaching for walls and cursing. I see myself willingly dismissing the popping outside as holiday fireworks, even though a simpleton knows that Halloween is not a fireworks event. Look, damn it, look! Pay attention! See the signs the universe is throwing at your stupid, pretty face! Now I shout at my living self during these reruns, knowing the ending never changes. This silly response beckons the definition of insanity. More deflating frustration always follows this scene. A duo of helicopters will race and hover overhead as the living me stumbles into bed in a huff. Wildfires, I guess again. No logic attempted. Any inquisitive nature at all would have deduced that no flame had ever reached the swanky getaway swallowed deep into the woods of the wealthy. Here's the part where I watch the living me throw a tantrum. I scream into my plush pillows. I need my things for tomorrow. 
Why wasn't everything fixed yet? Why was I being treated like a poor person? Kendall's handlers would have checked in by now. Nikki DeJager, Addison Ray. They weren't worried whether they could power a hair dryer or stream a pre-show tomorrow. They have nothing riding on it as I do. I'm negotiating a sponsorship with Sephora. Thoughts of finally having my own money instead of daddy's paltry allowance had swam around for weeks. No more suffering through escalades without personalized stitching or being forced to live in that tiny five-bedroom guest house on his property. It was unfair, these burdens. Not a single person living is more cursed than I am. Amazingly, I had these tone-deaf, privileged thoughts. Every time I watch this ordeal unfold, I am thrilled that I die the next day. Somewhere in the middle of the night, heavy thuds erupt from the front door, and it jolts me upright and I peek through the curtain below. Had trick-or-treaters or pranksters trespassed? The banging continues, and I can make out a rough outline of some car a cop would drive? I think maybe I see the shape of lights atop the vehicle, but I'm not sure. Then the living me came to the most foolish conclusion a person could conceive in such a moment. It had to be the spa girl. Was she insane? What good would a foot massage be at this hour? This girl must have tried in vain to make up for her lateness upon hearing who her client was. She was probably trying to save her job, but I am irate. I go back under my layers and put a pillow over my head. Eventually, the thumping fades into the acoustics of a car driving away. I manage to doze off in an orgy of anger, frustration, and sadness. Visions of vengeance, my only calming force. Death becomes me the next day. Morning has finally arrived, but the electricity has not. I run through the usual predictable failures, attempting magic with the gadgets that will never manifest. The sun is dim today. I mumble as I pass the window without bothering to see why. You know, no longer will the dead me mention how ignorant I was in life because it's becoming entirely redundant and it crushes me to watch. Tears flow as I realize the power is gone for good. I spent hours fiddling with my hair before finally settling on an updo that was junior prom quality. Maybe battery-powered blow dryers weren't so gauche. Now comes the foreign ringing. Landline telephones were never something I'd used, but I'd watched old TV shows. <laughs> How hard could it be? I would never know. I continued to be ashamed of my imperviousness in life. How could I think it was a security system glitch? Just how? My naivete was criminal and, obviously, fatal. Time blurs, and I can only assume the ceremony is getting close. The limo could arrive at any time. I apply my makeup quite well with minimal lighting, at least enough to draw attention to my face and away from my hair. I slink into the Versace with ease, the hunger pangs in my stomach telling me why. Things that sparkle are adorned with perfection, and lastly, I wiggle my feet into a pair of peep-toe pumps that the Jessica Simpson line is paying me to be seen in. Time to exhale and try to reclaim my center, as my meditation guru in Bel Air has taught me. Then, my silhouette throws its shadow through the doorframe for the first time in days. Well, this is when it all made sense to the living me when all of the missed signs and blatant warnings flash before me. You know, quite a jarring thing to realize mere seconds after it's too late. I suddenly remembered the note from Daddy, the SUV was empty now and there was no driving out of here, the people on the highway staring above at something, the frantic attempts by others to reach me, the sirens and breaking news and police officers and missed miracles. <laughs> Even Daddy's silly movie collection now appears to have been a gutting case of foreshadowing. None of this matters now, though. If irony has a taste, it is very, very bitter. Dressed like a queen, I must appear to be presenting myself to them as the elite my celestial neighborhood has to offer. Or perhaps they understand our ways and think I'm giving Halloween my best shot. Anyway, it is quite an image to absorb. Almost too beautiful to be horrifying. Almost. Like a checkerboard crafted with precision and exact mathematical spacing, the sky above is filled with the ovular ships for miles and beyond. The massive array of the invading army is a lesson in eerie excellence as the behemoth vessels rest in silence and stillness. No longer does life prove its existence through the twittering of birds or the banal echoes of humans at play. 
the alien menace floats as conquering gods, and I know in this exact moment that all is lost. At least it was quick and painless. The piercing yet calming light from the ship directly above as it entered my soul, that was the last thing I'll ever remember of life. Now, I'm cursed to replay the heedless flaws of my character until a higher power dictates otherwise. I suppose I can take solace in looking good while I wait. One thing is certain, I'm proof that the paranormal is real. I mean, who else can say they've answered the questions of whether we're alone in the universe, as well as if there's something beyond death, all in one day? Neither is more frightening than the pedestrian detachment that brought me here. The only proverb I ever knew said, the dead cannot reveal any secrets. It said nothing of revealing the dreadful, cruel ruination that comes from being oblivious. I hope you enjoyed Oblivious, as written by John Allen and voiced by Melissa Medina. As a reminder, voice actress Melissa Medina's work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H-E-A-R-M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com. Our second tale of the evening is written by Samuel J. Allen and performed by Nick Goroff. In it, we'll hear a tale of a man recounting an ongoing ordeal that has haunted him throughout his life all the way into old age. Now, without further ado, I present to you Dirt Beneath My Fingernails. My eyes opened to total blackness. Though I was on my back, this was not the mere dark of a bedroom in the depths of a clouded winter night, but complete, enveloping darkness pressing me on all sides. My first thought was that I'd gone blind. As I instinctively raised my hands to my eyes, my knuckles scraped against rough wood hard enough to break the skin. I cried out in pain, a cry which echoed dully back to me as soon as it escaped my lips. I groped blindly around me, that same rough wood meeting my fingers on all sides. My heart began to race, the thudding filling my ears, accompanied only by short, ragged breaths as my lungs sucked in the fetid air of my confines and dread washed over me in waves. I kicked out wildly, pounding the soles of my shoes as hard and as fast as I could, given the limited space, but was met by more solid, unmoving wood. I thrashed my shoulders from side to side in the grip of overwhelming panic now. I could feel cold beads of sweat forming on my back as I continued to lash out, breathless, almost to the point of choking. I tried to arch my back against the wood and put my weight into pushing myself upwards. I rocked back and forth in a fury, hoping something might give, for just the barest hint of light creep its way in. And finally... After my frantic, angry blows had done nothing, save bruising my arms and leave my hands a splintered ruin, I began to scream for help. After a few minutes, my throat was burning and gasping for breath. I forced myself to be still, thinking rationally for the first time. I lay still in that all-encompassing darkness and explored my confines more delicately. I was in a wooden box... That was all I knew with any certainty. I hadn't heard any sounds since waking, and so must be somewhere remote. Beyond that, I was at a loss to understand what had happened. The last thing I remembered was walking home around midnight after a Friday evening spent at the local pub. How had I ended up here? With my panic subsiding slightly, I tried to think of a rational explanation kidnap? Some accident? After minutes of racking my brain and no closer to a solution, I decided the why didn't matter. The more pressing concern was the need to escape from this box. I felt slowly around the wood surrounding my upper half, examining the joins, searching for nails or screws, praying for the slightest give or sign of weakness. 
I shifted as best as I could down towards the base of the box, where my feet had stamped to no avail. Or so I thought. I strained to reach the end, contorting to allow my scraped and bleeding fingers to explore. I felt the smallest movement, where one board met another, the merest hint of an opportunity, and poked my hand through, hoping to gain some leverage. My fingers were met by cold earth. Waves of utter panic and dread washed over me for a second time. My breath caught in terror as coughs racked my chest, the implications of where I was and what had happened now agonizingly clear for the first time. I had been buried alive. Fighting the urge to vomit, I withdrew my hand from the small hole I had fought to create, partly in disbelief and partly in denial from what I now knew to be true. Tears formed and fell quickly, stinging my eyes, and for minutes I lay still. It was only then that it first occurred to me that I might need to conserve air. Had I died and been buried with the faintest hint of a pulse, a victim of some horrific medical mistake only to wake six feet under, somehow it all just felt wrong. In the blackness, I examined my clothing with my damaged hands. I didn't seem to be wearing a suit. There was no tie, jacket, and in my pocket, I could feel my wallet and house keys. This was not burial attire. I was dressed in the same thin shirt and jeans I had put on. What I thought was the evening before, though I had no way of telling how long it had been since my midnight walk towards home. There was no cloth of velvet lining beneath me. Only that same rough wood and surrounded me on all sides. I felt no hinges, no signs of craftsmanship or care. Only what seemed to be a makeshift box barely big enough for me to lay down straight. If this box had been hurriedly or poorly made, then there was the possibility, however unlikely, of escape. Focusing on the small breach my frantic kicks made and the joints of the wood, I forced my hand through the hole and clawed my way into the dirt beyond. I put all the weight I could into pulling at that single board, ignoring the splinters that bit like fangs into my forearm. The joint seemed to crack like the dull snapping of a bone, though these sounds were muted by the earth encasing it. The soil began to pour in through the gap and pool around my feet. My breathing was heavy, ragged. I began to feel lightheaded and dizzy, more aware now the oxygen was likely scarce as my heart raced, body filled with adrenaline. I screamed in agony as a fingernail was torn from its bed, caught on the trailing shard of wood. And yet, this pain only made me more resolute. Sure, I could make it to the surface. The first one joins, then another gives way. I could hear a groaning as the weight of the earth above bore down upon the makeshift casket. The board, which had served as the lid of my confines, gave way, and finally shattered, as I kicked wildly upwards. The dirt fell in light rain around me, as I finally managed to haul myself into a sitting position, choking from the dirt falling into my mouth as I dug upwards in the darkness. The soil was loose, freshly turned. I tucked my head down to my chest and raised my arms, clasped together into the dirt, clawing my way upwards in some vertical mimicry of a breaststroke through the earth. I felt the dirt fall in thick clumps beside me, gradually able to rise, first to my knees, and then into a crouch. With one final agonizing push, I managed to break through the surface and felt the cold air on my ravaged fingers. Soon after, I hauled myself up, scrabbling on the loosed earth to freedom. Fresh air. To life. I fell, exhausted, unable to stand, next to the hole which was to have been my gravesite. Hands a red ruin caked in black, fingernails broken, arms bleeding from a dozen scrapes and splinters. I lay gasping, lungs burning but grateful for each breath of cool air. As my eyes accustomed as they were to the darkness, slowly adjusted, I managed to take in my surroundings. It was a cloudless night. 
the only hint of light from the crescent moon above. Though I could only see maybe 30 feet on all sides, I knew this wasn't a cemetery. There were no headstones, no flowers, just an empty wasteland stretching out into the darkness, my would-be grave, the only hint of any disturbance. With no other course of action to take, I walked slowly into the darkness, praying I might pass a familiar landmark if indeed I was anywhere close to home. After half an hour or so of slow, clumsy and uncertain staggers through barren grassland, I came upon a road I recognised and collapsed, exhausted, unable to will my cramping legs to move another inch. Eventually, I was roused by the blinding beam of headlights and, through gritted teeth, managed to rise to my feet and as the car slowed, I flagged it down in the darkness. I was 34 years old when I was buried alive for the first time. That was 1978. Over the past 40 or so years, I have dug and clawed and scratched my way from the suffocating, soul-crushing blackness 18 times, and yet I still don't know why this is happening to me. I've lived my whole life in a small town on the outskirts of Lancashire, England. As a young man, I left school, the earliest opportunity found employment as a labourer, eventually branching out on my own as a jack-of-all-trades builder working for myself. I never liked the big city, and can count on one hand the number of times I've travelled more than 50 miles from home. Strange, I'm sure, to most, especially as travel to distant and exotic lands has become much easier over the past few decades. This place always felt like home, though. I yearned for it. A few times I was away on holiday as a teenager. I don't broadcast that fact too loudly, but after waking up in a cramped box deep in the dirt, struggling to breathe and barely able to straighten your legs, even small towns like this one can seem like a whole world. The town's location is important, though the irony of its name is not lost on me, should you ever care to work out my origins. It won't be challenging with so much information available at your fingertips. Of course, that first night I went straight to the police, insisting, and likely incomprehensibly, that the kind stranger who found me by the side of the road drove me straight to the station on Irwell Street, but quickly disappeared as soon as we arrived. I told my story as the first pink light of dawn began to shine through the small window in a bare and unwelcoming interview room. The bored-looking sergeant who had ushered me in had to stifle a yawn as I began my tale. Skeptical, despite my fervent conviction and obvious injury. I was told that it was now the early hours of Sunday morning, meaning I had somehow lost an entire day. After repeated questions about my mental health, any drinking problems, any drug problems and criminal history, it was reluctantly agreed that we would drive out to where I was found by the side of the road and retrace my steps to the spot I had freed myself from the dirt. And so we went. The walk through the empty fields did not take nearly as long in the light of day. Though darkness had hidden all landmarks from me the night before, I was certain we moved in the right direction. After descending a small crest, with the field sloped downward and onto a flat expanse, we came upon a small patch of broken ground. There! I cried, hurrying as best as I could to that singular spot of earth in the otherwise undisturbed landscape. The sergeant followed in no great hurry. There was no grave, no remnants of the shattered wood that had caged me, only freshly moved earth, the hole filled and flattened. I clawed down into the dirt with my hands, the same earth I'd fought to free myself from only hours earlier. The cuts that marred my fingers opened anew, sending rivulets of blood snaking down my palms and into the mud. I sank my arms, elbow deep into the dirt, searching manically for any stray pieces of timber. Nothing. A few tiny shavings of wood littered the mud, and there, protruding from the dirt, like the budding of a small flower, sat a single nail, bent and twisted. The sergeant was unmoved by my find, and increasingly impatient. I protested. Whoever did this to me has been back. Filled the grave and taken everything away. The sergeant shook his head and 
angrily explained that a solitary nail and a few flecks of wood meant nothing across the miles of scrubland, that there were a hundred different ways those items could have ended up strewn in this field. Certainly, it was not enough to suggest some conspiracy, particularly as I told the police back at the station I couldn't think of anyone with a motive to do me such harm. That was only half the truth. I could see how it looked, how unbelievable my story must seem. I also understand whoever had done this to me must have done a significant amount of research and preparation. This was not simply bad luck on my part, no wrong place, wrong time. My tormentor had likely waited, lurking unseen in the shadows to see if I managed to claw my way out to freedom and then to dispose of all the evidence quickly. It was the fear that this was some targeted attack that outweighed the frustration I felt at not being believed. This was all part of the plan. I was warned sternly about wasting police time and taken back to the station. If I dropped the matter immediately and withdrew my initial report, there would be no further repercussions at the time. A more senior officer also advised me that if I were to make such unsubstantiated and wild claims in the future, it would not end well for me. What else could I do but retract? I told a few close friends about what had happened, and they too were disbelieving, and it soon became a subject of ridicule. I hadn't wanted to burden my aging parents with this horror, and so suffered alone. The recollection is so strong in those first weeks, that when I did manage to fall asleep, I woke to my heart pounding, gasping for air, and covered in a film of sweat entangled in my bed sheets. Those memories, which haunted my nights in the early days, slowly faded to the point that eventually they seemed like some ethereal dream, vivid but imagined. I devoured newspapers, both local and national, for any sign of similar happenings, but found nothing. I slowly came to accept I'd never have any real closure. This awful, terrible thing had happened, and I just needed to move on. And so, for about 18 months, my life slowly returned to a semblance of normality, until I woke in that darkness for a second time. I won't recount all of the times I found myself in that dreaded, now familiar blackness. It would take far too long, and the process is always more or less the same. The panic, the kicking, splinters from shattering wood, hauling myself up through suffocating dirt, bleeding arms and choking out into some empty field, but still close enough to home, and always, always, with that chance of escape. The boards and timber that form my confines have changed little through the years, still crudely made with hammer and nail. There has been no innovation to the design to encase me more severely, to trap me in an inescapable tomb. The prize of freedom was always within my grasp if I had the strength to take it. This, I am sure, is how it was designed. Continuous eternal torture, one which I had been condemned to repeat for reasons unknown. Much like Sisyphus in his boulder, I was doomed to endure my punishment over and over, though I also had to contend with that constant worry of when I would next awake to that omnipresent blackness under the earth, and the indignity of being disbelieved by all, unable to share the terrors I faced, forsaken to suffer alone. It was never the same place twice. I drove myself almost to madness searching for some meaning or symbolism behind the locations to no avail. I plotted maps as best I could of each of my would-be graves, studied local histories, searched my memories for links or connections to those places, wondering how many others might be suffering in that same way. I can't pretend I've been a good man. I searched my soul, my conscience, both then and now, for what hurt or tragedy I might be responsible for that would warrant such unending torture. My mind has never settled on one event with any certainty, and flits between the causes likely to have elicited such an extraordinary effort on the part of my tormentor. Was it someone from the family whose six-year-old daughter had been crushed to death as the roof of their home extension collapsed on top of her during the night? 
I was not solely to blame, of course, but I was the one who had completed the final checks following the construction, and it was I who cut cost after cost on both labour and materials, all to maximise my profits. Had the child's father, or older brother, or some distant uncle taken it upon themselves to mete out the justice the courts and a lack of concrete evidence could not provide? Did they think that me having to dig my way out from beneath the earth was some ironic punishment, mirroring what had happened to that poor girl? I cannot know. Or could it be a son or a daughter of Mrs. Braithwaite, the elderly widower, whom I swindled out of thousands and thousands of pounds for a needless home renovation to combat growing subsidence. I admit it here. I took advantage of that poor older woman, health in severe decline and unable to understand, let alone verify what I was telling her. I scared her, telling her if I didn't begin work immediately, that the house might collapse on top of her during the night. I said that to her without a hint of shame, despite what had happened to that poor little girl. In truth, I carried out no such work. The bare minimum for it seemed as if I had reinforced the structure and secured it against non-existent issues. Denied their inheritance by a con man, all that money, hard earned by their mother and father over a lifetime, soon squandered on alcohol and gambled away. Had this been enough to inspire such hatred towards me that they conspired together to destroy my life? Then there was the night when I had a little too much to drink, following a meal with friends out of town, and not wanting to be stranded deep in the countryside, had made the unwise decision to drive back home through pitch-black rural lanes. Distracted by the blast of the radio and attempts to light another cigarette to clear my swimming head, I heard the thud of something heavy hit my bumper. My eyes flew to the road just as the dark shape blurred into the windscreen before disappearing into the darkness beyond. I was so sure it must have been an animal, A large fox, maybe, or a stray sheep escaped from some nearby farm. What else could it be out there on the back roads in the middle of the night? But what if I was wrong? I had made no attempt to search for whatever had collided with the car, instead speeding home to safety, trying to push the incident out of my mind. In the cold light of the next morning, I saw a small crack in the corner of the windshield, and in that fracture pooled into the cracks, rivulets of deep and sticky crimson. After a few days without incident and emboldened by the lack of news reports concerning a hit and run or accident close to where I had collided with something, I drew a line under the event and moved on. Though now I am plagued with doubt about exactly what happened. It has been so long, I honestly cannot remember whether the lies I might have told myself for so long had become truth within my memory. Had I killed someone whose loved one had taken it upon themselves to perform some perverse vigilante justice, obsessing over my movement? There are other events, things I am not proud of, acts as a young man that now fills me with shame and regret. Surely, though, no one worthy of this. The constant worry hung over me like a storm cloud. Its shadow only grew darker as time went on. I became suspicious of all those around me. Surely, it must be someone close to me who knows my habits, my routines. I began to isolate myself from the few friends I had left. All activities other than work were discarded from my life. A few times I managed to find a ray of hope. In that crushing worry, I soon found myself below ground. That familiar dirt ingrained deep under my fingernails once again. Despite my now suspicious and insular personality and reluctance to leave my home, I'd somehow been lucky enough to meet a woman during a brief late-night trip to the local supermarket. She was kind, recently divorced, and had troubles of her own. Although I never quite managed to tell her about the burials that pockmarked the brutal last decade and a half of my life, I felt simply being with her meant my burden was shared, even if I hadn't spoken it aloud. She shared with me her pain of watching her father succumb to dementia, slowly at first, but worsening, it seemed, day by day towards the end. 
In his final weeks, he had forgotten her completely. Much like myself, she had no remaining family, and over time her friendships had lapsed and faded, as they so often do when life begins to overwhelm. I was all she had, and when the inevitable happened and her father passed on, I helped her to make the necessary arrangements and promised her I would be there to offer comfort and support in her grief. So, consumed as I was by my newfound love and by the first real responsibility I had had to someone for years, I dreamed for a few naive months that this might signal the end of my wretched punishment. Maybe whoever was doing this to me had died or decided I'd endured enough misery and fear for one lifetime. I was a different person, though, and instead of laying beneath my blanket each night, sweating, fearful, and restless, my thoughts were consumed by another for whom I was so desperate to be there. And yet, as the morning of her father's funeral came on a cold, early January day, I found myself scrabbling beneath the hard, frozen dirt. Mercifully, I hadn't been buried deep. It must have been some effort to remove a few feet of solid earth, and the box that held me looked to have been made quickly and crudely, as though this plan had been less well executed, more rushed than before. I finally managed to claw my way above a snow-covered ground and into a sky filled with hues of copper and violet. Even this scant light warmed me somewhat. I turned my face towards the sun as I stood shivering in my bedclothes and slippers, arms clasped tightly to my chest, fingers bloodied, feeling like fire in spite of the cold. My mind cleared in the sharp morning air as I took in my surroundings. This place was familiar. I saw Holcomb Tower, high on its hill, casting an elongated shadow down towards me in the dawn light. I was less than two miles from home. Despite the frigid temperature, and freezing terrain, I could make it home quickly. Maybe there was still time. I could still be where I was needed most to offer support and comfort to my love in the depth of her grief and despair, to read the words she had written in the eulogy, but knew she wouldn't have the strength to say. I'd told her I would be there each step of the way to make a breakfast, though she wouldn't feel like eating. I took her hand as we made our way into the church, to be the shoulder to lean on as we followed the hearse to the cemetery and held her as the inevitable tears came as her father's coffin was lowered into the earth. The hope that I might still do all that kept me going, even through my shivering as my lungs burned and feet struggled for purchase on the frozen ground, the biting wind whipped around me. But that vivid purple and orange light dulled and melted soon into grey as the sun began to crawl towards the horizon. This was not the dawn I had thought. It was dusk, and in those dying embers of light all hope vanished. And as the sun disappeared, so did my will to continue. I collapsed to the frosted ground by the side of a tall oak. And in the growing twilight I wept as the first flurry of evening snow began to fall. They must have taken me close to dawn and kept me sedated for much of the day. I missed the funeral and a final fledgling chance for happiness. My absence and broken promises were unforgivable, and any chance for an explanation was in vain. She would not answer my repeated phone calls and moved away soon after. All ties to her extinguished. I never saw my love again. I spent the night of my 50th birthday beneath the cold ground. The town had been in the grips of a fierce autumn storm front, which had raged for almost a fortnight, the relentless rain causing flooding, school closures, and making many roads impassable. This didn't affect me particularly, as I rarely left the house now, other than for the dwindling occasions I was the last resort for the most menial building jobs or essential shopping trips. The last thing I remember was sitting at home reading when I heard a noise at the back of the house. Wary of possible debris breaking windows, I hurried outside to the garden and into the storm, the face pinpricked by hail. As I fought against the gale, moving plant pots and ornaments into the shed, I felt a sharp stabbing pain in the back of my neck as a shadow flitted past. I fell backward, prone onto the soaking ground as the hail lashed into my eyes, then nothing. 
until I woke up wet and shivering in a wooden box. I wouldn't have believed a man could drown underground, yet as thick mud began to trickle into the box where I'd managed to kick a hole in the lid, I was sure I would be swallowed by the heavy earth flowing like magma. That time, more than any, I nearly failed. I was so tired, held in place as if I was caught in tar. I was close to unconsciousness by the time I managed to slide my hand through the sodden dirt, every muscle burning back in spasms. After reaching the surface, I spent the night curled up by the dirt, unable to will my body to move even slightly to the cover of a nearby tree. To do this today of all days, lashed by rain and hail, battling against a howling wind that taken true determination, a mindful, unwavering commitment to steal even the merest hint of joy or contentment I might have left in my miserable existence. Burials never occur with any regularity or predictability. There's no pattern, nothing to signify it is close, no full moon abductions or significant dates. I found myself beneath the dirt three times within the span of a year. Once, I almost went four years without incident. I've attempted to check myself in the hospital dozens of times over the years, to volunteer, to demand any barrage of tests available, to try and find out how this keeps happening. It must be some drug or sedative, but there's always such reluctance obvious in the eyes of the doctors and nurses to acquiesce to what they must view are the ramblings and idiocies of a drunkard, madman, a hypochondriac. A man convinced someone is drugging him, abducting him from his own home, and repeatedly burying him alive, though always with the possibility of escape. I know how it sounds. As sure as I know that by the time I dig myself out, make it far enough to tell anyone and get them back to my temporary grave, all evidence, save some disturbed soil, has vanished. I even covered head to toe in dirt, blood drying when my arms have pulled me from the dirt, fingernails bleeding, nobody is convinced. All I am ever met with are disbelieving looks, with a hint of pity, buried in their scepticism. Without a police report, for which I am now too afraid to make, lest I be committed to some asylum, I am denied my request, and so the mystery, fear, and misery continue. You might wonder why I hadn't simply moved away to some faraway land, escaped to some tropical paradise where the cost of living was next to nothing. It all sounds so simple today, but 40 years ago, with a lack of formal education, no savings, still living in the same small house I inherited after my mum died, I had no fallback, no skills. I would have likely ended up homeless, unable to resist the urge to gamble and fritter away a lump sum from the sale of the house. All my ill-gotten gains also squandered quickly away. I used to say that whoever is responsible for my lifelong torture wouldn't follow me wherever I run. Maybe they too are now old, no longer able to abduct me so effortlessly, with such inexplicable precision and planning despite my precautions. Perhaps they also find themselves in an aging body betraying them. Arms now too weak to wield shovel and move the mounds of hard earth. Fingers are no longer dexterous enough to construct those wooden boxes with hammer and nail. The fear remains, though. They have passed this hideous ritual on to another. Even though familiar ties and some twisted sense of responsibility, or they have the means to employ some unpleasant character or criminal element to continue their bidding. Maybe someone I wronged has the means to put this curse on me in perpetuity. Even if they are long dead, there could be those whose purpose is to continue with my torture, thinking more rationally. Perhaps whoever has been tormenting me over the past 40 years has died, and I can now live out whatever time I have left without the crushing weight of worry. It's not knowing that is slowly driving me mad. The Sunday just passed, marked my 75th birthday. A cause for celebration, some might say. Oh, I had no wish for any festivities. Besides, with whom would I celebrate? I only carve out a miserable and solitary existence within the four aging walls of the house I have lived my life within 
consumed by a constant gnawing in the back of my mind and hideous dreams filled with crumbling yellowed bones and fat pink earthworms slithering all over me in the darkness. All the strength I once had, my broad shoulders, arms corded with muscle, now withered and shrunken, more resembling parchment paper, pulled taut over protruding and fragile bones. Were I to wake in that suffocating darkness now, I would have no means of escape, no strength to fight from the dirt and haul myself towards survival, to the air and sun above. This is what terrifies me the most. Scratching, screaming in the darkness, gasping for air as I slowly suffocate, hearing my final, futile breaths as my death rattle echoes back to me from my confines, knowing I would lay hidden beneath the dirt in some nameless field, no gravestone, unknown to the world as my body rots, erasing all evidence that I ever even existed at all. I suppose, in some ways, that is why I've decided to share this with you, so that I may have at least some semblance of permanence in a life wasted on fear and worry and regret. I watched an old film last night, a black and white World War II drama. The hero officer is captured by the Nazis, and just before he can bite into the cyanide pill hidden in his back tooth, he's rescued by his men. It made me pause and wonder at the possibility of such a contingency for myself, though my research seems to suggest this was nothing more than fanciful storytelling. It seems I have only two realistic choices, to live in fear of the inevitable in my final years, or to exercise the last minuscule fragment of free will I have left, to take away that last victory from whoever has spent so much of their own life invested in my misery, to end my life on my own terms, well above the dirt, to say goodbye to the world above ground, in the warmth with the sun on my face, so that I may rest peacefully in a place of my choosing, with a headstone bearing my name. Tomorrow at dusk, I shall swallow all the digoxin pills my doctor prescribed to help stabilize my irregular heartbeat. A full bottle should be enough to bring me to a swift, painless end. I'll sit out in the garden as the sun sets, and as I feel the beginnings of my slide toward death, toward peace, I shall call the authorities and tell them where to find me, without leaving an opportunity to revive me. I'll be declared dead at the hospital. These days they don't make mistakes. There won't be any chance I'll find myself buried beneath that dirt once again. I'll die on my own terms, finally free of the torment that has haunted me these past forty years, and clasped in my stiff hands this confession, a final chance to tell my story and unburden myself after a lifetime of regret and misery. I'll end my tale here, hoping I've delved into enough detail that you can be sure these aren't the ravings of a lunatic, or an older man who has lost his wits. And one last request, for whoever might read this, if you will be so kind. Please cremate my remains, and scatter my ashes to the wind. I hope you enjoyed Dirt Beneath My Fingernails, as written by Samuel J. Allen and performed by Nick Goroff. Samuel J. Allen's work and author profile can be found by visiting www.creepypastastories.com under the name Allen. That's A-L-L-E-N. There you can find his Amazon page and Twitter account, all of which feature his amazing talents. Voice actor and 2016 Evil Idol champion Nick Goroff's talents can be found on our very own Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, as well as on past episodes of the Simply Scary podcast. You can also join Nick on his YouTube channel, Wizard of Cause. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight. 
and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.